very much, Ralph, and thank all of you for being here. I'm going to speak for about 20 minutes. Uh, and um, uh, I just want to say that uh, I've been studying uh, about the Cathars in the writings, uh, especially of Arthur Girdham, for approximately 20 years. One of the books that I'll show you actually had an imprint of Samuel Weiser, which was a metaphysical bookstore here in New York that disappeared from the scene uh, 15, 20 years ago. So that's where I bought at least one of the books uh, that I've studied on the Cathars. And Ralph is 100% right. I reread uh, four of these books, and I'm actually rereading even more, or rather reading even more, of Dr. Girdham's books uh, because he, he wrote a great deal not only about the Cathars but about many other subjects um, and I'll mention that um, as I go along. I'm going to start with the brief biography of Arthur Girdham. By the way, just to back up a moment, um, here I've been studying about the Cathars for all of these years and this quest is going to bring these places to life for me and for those of you who come with us for you, I believe. So it's quite thrilling. I'm going to start with a brief biography of Dr. Arthur Girdham, who was he. Uh, then I'm going to give a synopsis of two of his books, uh, specifically about the Cathars. And then I'm going to wind up with um, a uh, review, uh, in brief, of some of Dr. Girdham's revelations about the Cathars, which is, uh, uh, Ralph said, uh, the um, story that we get about Catharism is primarily from the Catholic Church and from the Inquisitional records. Um, and what you get in Dr. Girdham's books is a very different picture indeed. So um, that's the outline of my talk. Um, Dr. Girdham was born in a region of England called Cumbria. Uh, in a small coastal city, northwest England. Uh, it was uh, near uh, the Lake District, which figured rather importantly in his uh, development and writings. He attended Oxford University, became a psychiatrist, and for 40 years he was um, um, with the National Health Service in England, where he became a senior clinical consultant as a psychiatrist. He was married and had several children. In addition to his work as a psychiatrist, he became a prolific author. And I've um, made a, a brief annotated bibliography that most of you have a copy of. If you don't have it now, you can get it as you leave. There are plenty of copies, I believe. And um, I asterisked four books. Those are the main ones about Catharism. But as you can see, he wrote about many other subjects, such as ESP, spirituality, history, and um, so forth, and, and medicine, and the interplay between these, that is medicine and spirituality and ESP. Um, so, um, uh, I'll leave you, leave you to review that uh, to get a sense of his uh, writings. He became interested in uh, Languedoc uh, through reading a book by uh, a British novelist named Ford Maddox Ford called Provence. And um, uh, <clears throat> he found uh, as in subsequent visits after becoming fascinated through <coughs> Ford Maddox Ford's book Provence, he started to visit in Languedoc and became fascinated by it. He said he found the area <coughs> strangely compelling. He felt haunted by Mont Segur, where the Cathars purged in large numbers uh, in 1244. Now, the first book about the Cathars was published in 1970. It's called The Cathars and Reincarnation. This and the other four asterisk books are all available on the internet, and that's why I didn't put publishers in my bibliography. So, this was the first book about the Cathars. And Ralph was 100% right in what he said. Um, his experiences began in 1962 with a woman who presented at the National Health Service. And uh, her presenting problem was nightmares. She was referred by another doctor. 
Miraculously, the nightmares ceased upon her first meeting with Dr. Gurdam. And um, uh, she'd had these nightmares two to three times a week since she was a teenager. And when she met Dr. Gurdam, she was 30 years old. Uh, she uh, would cry out so loudly at night that she and her husband feared that they would wake up everybody in the street and be terribly embarrassed and um, feel terribly that they'd woken everybody in the middle of the night. So um, she continued to experience unusual dreams. Uh, and um, as it turned out, she started to have more and more memories, uh, also called far memory of past lifetimes, of a past lifetime in the Languedoc during the time of the Cathars. She had times also during the day when past, present, and future seemed fused. And in those times, she went out of time and had some of her uh, memories of her Cathar lifetime. According to a writer um, uh, about uh, Dr. Gurdam's life, um, she uh, uh, first remembered about her Cathar incarnation uh, when uh, Dr. Gurdam, in a rather uncharacteristic gesture of his, went to her house to uh, uh, reschedule a canceled appointment. It was very unusual for him. And it was snowing that day. And when she opened the door, she had a uh, past life memory, a far memory of him knocking on her door when he was Roger Isson, Isson of Fanjou uh, um, in the 13th century. And um, at that time, he was a Cathar parfait. Um, the term parfait uh, means perfect one. But the, the Cathar, uh, Cathars didn't call themselves that. Uh, they, they liked to be known as Christians, good Christians, or true Christians. But people called them, as Ralph said, les bonhommes, or the good people. So uh, she had these dreams, um, and um, she, uh, uh, the main factor in Dr. Girdham recalling his own past lifetime, which he had as a uh, Kafir prophet, was uh, Mrs. Smith, this woman, who had these unusual uh, unfolding experiences of memories. Now, uh, they stayed in touch even after she ceased to be a patient of his, uh, through letters, through phone calls, and she mentioned to Dr. Gertham names dates and facts from her night dreams and from her daytime experiences related to the Cathars. He in turn checked out these facts with two authorities, Professor Nelly of Toulouse University, an expert on the Cathars, and the second one was Jean Duvonoy, um, I'm perhaps not pronouncing it correctly, the French authority on Catharism. And they were amazed at the veracity of these facts. Dr. Gurdam says he didn't tell them that they were from a woman who was having a past life memory. But they were accurate uh, in every way. One of the details, very obscure, but very true, was that the uh, Cathar Parfaits wore robes of dark blue. It had been believed up till that time uh, by most people that they wore black robes, and that was not true. They wore dark blue robes. And this came to her, and she insisted it was true. And Dr. Gurdam checked it out with, um, with uh, uh, Jean de Vornori and um, uh, with um, Professor Nelly, and found out that, in fact, this was the case. She also remembered certain names of relatively obscure figures uh, of the Cathar drama. And it was revealed over time that she was a peasant girl named Porilia, who in fact became the lover and companion of, um, <clears throat> of um, 
of Do Do Dr. Gurdam in his past lifetime as Roger Isson of uh, Fanjur. Mrs. Smith also recalled poems in French or Asatan that Roger would recite to her. And guess what? These were troubadour poems. And um, uh, Dr. Gurdam comments, this is, there is a close relationship between Catharism and the cult of the troubadours. Many of the noble families converted to Catharism were also patrons of the troubadours. So, let's go right to We Are One Another, the next book about the Cathars that Dr. Gerdam wrote. In this book, the story expands to eight people with whom he somehow, on various mysterious ways, came in contact. Eight people who turned out themselves to have had past lifetimes as Cathars. And um, let's see, um, the most important of these contacts from We All One Another is um, Claire Mills. Claire Mills uh, came into Arthur Gidham's life in a synchronistic way, you could call it accidental. Her motor car, to use a British term, broke down outside uh, his house. She knocked on the door and, uh, to make a phone call, and uh, Dr. Gidham's uh, wife, Mary, invited her to tea, and she became a regular visitor for tea. Upon one visit, she asked Dr. Gidham, do the names Raymond and Albigensian mean anything to you? These are names that just came to her. And uh, as many of you may know, uh, Raymond is Raymond VI, Count of Toulouse, a very important figure in the Cathar drama. And um, Albigensian is simply another name for the Cathars, also for this region. It's, uh, the town of Albi is in the Languedoc. So, um, <clears throat> she began to have more names that came to her in dreams, similar to Mrs. Smith from the Cathars and Reincarnation, names that came to dreams, to, to her in dreams and waking consciousness. And um, uh, once again, Dr. Gurdon would check them out with his own, in his own extensive library on Catharism but mainly with Professor Nelly and Jean de Vornoy, and uh, found them invariably accurate. So, um, it turned out that she had had a Cathar lifetime as Esclamond de Perella, a Cathar parfait herself, who had experienced the siege of Montségur and was burned at the stake after its defenders capitulated. Um, all kinds of things came to her. The names of classical philosophers who had been read by and whose philosophy in many ways was similar to that of the Cathars, such as Pythagoras and Plotinus and Iamblichus, as well as St. Paul's writings. The uh, uh, First Corinthians, for example, was very sacred to the Cathars. Um, and all kinds of quotations in Latin and French, as well as drawings. She began then to receive visitations by Cathar associates from what you could call the other side, the astral plane, the undiscovered country, whatever you want to call the after-death realm. And this is an amazing part of his experience. These uh, uh, revenants, he called them, or returning ones, came to her in uh, uh, dreams and sometimes during the day in full wakefulness. And over time, Dr. Girdham himself became able to see and interact with these revenants. Who were the revenants? The revenants were Cathars uh, from um, uh, his past lifetime, their past lifetime, associates in that lifetime. And one of the things that the revenants taught her was healing techniques rather incredible healing techniques that she practiced on Dr. Gurdam and other people who started mysteriously and almost miraculously coming to her for healing. 
and she would practice these techniques that the revenants had been teaching her that were enormously effective. This is called hands-on healing and it's a tradition from original Christianity which Ralph had mentioned. So, um, I already mentioned um, that um, about the, uh, how the revenants came to her. This is a completely unique aspect of the experience because it was not the case in the Cathars and Reincarnation. There were no revenants in that particular book, but in this book they're extremely prominent. Also prominent is um, other people who came into the picture, such as Betty. Betty turned out to have been herself uh, a Cathar parfait, and in the 20th century, she was a woman whose husband died suddenly. And she called up an old school chum from 20 years ago, Claire Mills, who was her friend many years before, and um, started to talk to her about her grief and so forth. Well, it was recommended that she go on a trip. She chose to go to southern France, and Dr. Girdham was asked to provide an itinerary, which he did. And um, lo and behold, these places in southern France had a deep, deep meaning to her. She kept a journal during that time. And in that journal, she wrote names uh, uh, and places and dates and experiences that came to her that it turned out related to her past lifetime. Not only that, but take a look at the cover of this book. You will see what looks like a child's drawing. Well, when she was seven years old and ill with scarlet fever, she kept a notebook in which she did various drawings. And when Dr. Girdham saw the drawings, because her mother entrusted Dr. Girdham with uh, um, this notebook of drawings, when he saw these drawings, he was amazed because they seemed to depict, and I believe that they did, the events at a very important event in Cathar history, uh, which is called Avignonnet. And Avignonnet, another very difficult to pronounce French word, uh, was a place where two inquisitors were murdered in 1242. This provided a pretext for Pope Innocent III and the nobles of northern France to renew their assault on the Cathars. And in fact, they did do just that. And uh, that's when uh, Montsegur fell in 1244. So these drawings are in that book, as well as Dr. Girdham's interpretations. And they are absolutely fascinating. Now I'll just give you an, a, an example of a detail that came uh, to um, uh, Claire Mills um, because she suffered from what's called anniversary reactions. As a psychologist, I'm very familiar with this. Anniversary reactions is when you, a certain event comes at a certain time uh, of the year and you respond to it as if it was yesterday. You respond to what happened uh, during that time, many years before. And this happened to Claire Mills and uh, also to some degree to Dr. Girdham. So for example, uh, during the time of the terrible assault on Montsegur, uh, the words came to her, salt, pepper, and wax. What in the world do salt, pepper, and wax have to do with the fall of Montsegur? It turns out that these were gifts that the Cathar Parfits gave to the um, soldiers who had defended them because when uh, right before the capitulation uh, they, or, I'm sorry, after the capitulation the uh, defenders, that is the sergeants at arms were allowed to leave if they wanted to and it turned out that some did leave with the wax, the pepper and the salt as gifts from the Cathar prophets and others chose to stay with them, the sergeants, the soldiers, and their wives, and were themselves burned at the stake. And that gives you an example of the dedication and devotion and love that people in Languedoc had for the Cathars. So, um, uh, 
let's see. Um, I've already touched on many of these things. Uh, we are one another climaxes with anniversary experiences and memories of the siege and surrender of Montsegur and the death uh, at the stake of several of the group members. It's very moving. So not only uh, uh, do these uh, books offer impressive proof of reincarnation and in fact group reincarnation, which this is called a record of group reincarnation. And there are other instances of this in the metaphysical literature, group reincarnation. It's a very fascinating phenomena. I haven't read all the books on it, but uh, there are a number of books about it. But um, it turns out that reincarnation was one of the main beliefs of the Cathars. What are other major beliefs of the Cathars? And this will be the last part of my talk. I'm going to quickly review with you 12 or so main essentials of belief of the Cathars and facts about the Cathar religion or Catharism as it's sometimes called. Now, Ralph already indicated that the Catholic Church and the records of the Inquisition offer a rather biased view of Catharism and that's very true. And the picture we get of it from Dr. Girdham's writings is vastly different in many ways. So, the first essential of belief is dualism. Uh, forces of good and evil existed from the beginning of the world and would exist until the end. And as Ralph said, this was an example of Manichaeism, which is also tied in with Zoroastrianism, with the cult of Mithras, um, and um, uh, that was essential belief. Forces of good and evil existed from the beginning of the world and would do so until the end. It turns out that it was also a belief of the Essenes, who many believed to have been associated with Jesus or Yeshua. Very interesting fact. Um, second essential of belief. This world was created by Satan, not by the good God, but by <laughs> Satan. And third, a belief that humans possess an immortal soul which is purified by repeated incarnations. And of course, we all recognize this is a belief in reincarnation. In Cathar practice, there were two broad classifications of members. And this is so important to understand because a great deal of the misunderstanding of Catharism is because of a misunderstanding of this basic fact. There were two basic types or classifications of Cathars. Number one, I've already mentioned the parfaits. Uh, these were the, uh, the, you could call them priests and priestesses, but those terms don't quite fit. But they were like the wise elders, perhaps that's a better way of describing them, of Catharism. At the most, uh, Arthur Gertham says there were about 4,000 of them. They were required to observe, uh, and, and these are the people called the good people, or the good men and women. Um, which is the term that uh, the people had for them. The, the parfaits were required to observe secondary rules of nonviolence, vegetarianism, fasting, and chastity. And 30% um, of the, of the parfaits were drawn from the nobility, and most were older people who had already had families. So this is a mistaken idea that the Cathars had to practice chastity. Only after they became parfaits, most of the parfaits had already had families. They had children. They had wives or husbands. The second classification were the believers, or croyants, the believers. And these were everyday people. And if they agreed with the basic tenets of, of uh, Catharism that I just mentioned, then they were believers. And um, what else is expect, was expected of them is relatively unknown. Now, how did the parfaits become parfaits? Well, they had an extensive, long period of training. And a very important part of that training was healing techniques. They became expert at uh, a technique practiced uh, by uh, early Christians. Uh, the apostles, the disciples, laying on of hands, practiced by Jesus himself. And 
Of course, it's unknown whether they did it in the same way, but uh, they developed an incredible armamentarium of healing arts, including the laying on of hands, including herbology, including um, naturalistic techniques of healing. They were, in fact, many of them were, in fact, doctors. And people traveled long distances to come to them to be healed. Ralph also mentioned the equality of men and women in Catharism. And that is extremely accurate. It's estimated by Professor Nelly that there were about equal, equal numbers of each gender as parfaits. And uh, women, in fact, were considered to have even greater ability than men uh, in, uh, as healers, in, as wisdom teachers, and in ESP abilities. ESP means extrasensory perception. Dr. Girdham laments in one of his books called Paradise Found that with the death of the prophets, the function of women as priestesses ended in Europe. The next few points about Cathar doctrine are very important, and I'm close to my end. <clears throat> the Cathars rejected the doctrine of grace. The doctrine of grace says that in order for me to be saved, I have to observe and experience these uh, sacraments of the Catholic Church. I have to be baptized, I have to be married in the church, and I have to receive the Eucharist. The Cathars rejected all of that which is summed up in the doctrine of grace. I need the church and its sacraments for my salvation. They also rejected the doctrine of the vicarious atonement. The vicarious atonement is the doctrine that Jesus died for our sins. He died for the sins of the whole world, as restitution, one might say. And they rejected that doctrine as well. Perhaps because they rejected that doctrine, they hated the crucifix. At least the croyants, or ordinary people, hated the crucifix. And a saying about the crucifix was, would you worship the gallows your father died upon? <laughs> the sole sacrament recognized by the Cathars was called the consoling ceremony, or the consolamentum. And its purpose was the rejection of the life of the flesh for the life of the spirit. It was administered only two times, and two very different times. First, as a recognition, or you could even call it, using our terminology, an initiation ceremony for people becoming parfaits. And second, upon the moment, uh, not the moment of, but uh, uh, when death was very near, and it was considered a person was about to die, they received the consoling ceremony or consolamentum. Um, now, there's a very beautiful prayer that I'd like to share with you that is considered possibly to have been part of the consolamentum. Uh, I, can, I learned about it actually on one of the esoteric quests, and it's an extremely beautiful one. It's mentioned by Dr. Girdham. And uh, this has to do with the Gnostic beliefs. Since we are not of this world, and this world is not of us, let us think as you think, and love as you love. Of course, the you is God. Since we are not of this world, let us think as you think, and love as you love. I think it's an extremely beautiful prayer. Like early Christianity for Dr. Girdham, Catharism was a religion of emanation. Christ's presence was what distinguished him from other people and made him able to perform the healing and the miracles attributed to him. He was considered by Dr. Girdham and apparently by the Cathars to have been clairvoyant himself and to have many ESP abilities Contact with, with Jesus or Yeshua brought about a process of divine ignition, a term used by uh, Dr. Gurdam, divine ignition. And a similar process occurred in the presence of the disciples, it was believed, the apostles, and the prophets. 
Like Rudolf Steiner and the anthroposophists, the Cathos believed that Jesus, and possibly Mary also, appeared in a spiritual body, and therefore he wasn't really crucified, he only appeared to have been crucified. This is sometimes known as the Docetist doctrine. His mission was to liberate human beings from the delusions and unreality of matter. Arthur Guernon believed that Catharism resembled the teachings and practices of early Christianity. I already mentioned this, especially its emphasis on healing, uh, healing the sick, and through the laying on of hands. He considered it more than heresy, and here's a quote from him. It was a comprehensive and lucid philosophy of enormous scope and considerable antiquity, one which he saw as remarkably modern. And these views are discussed at great length in the uh, <coughs> Great Heresy, uh, which is subtitled, The History and Belief of the Cathars. I highly recommend this book to anyone interested in Catharism because better than a historian, it came from someone who had himself been a Cathar. If you believe all of this, and you may not, and I respect your beliefs, uh, if you don't believe it, that's fine. Check the books out and see what you, in fact, do believe. Maybe you will come to a different conclusion. So, for the Cathars, God was love, and God was only responsible for what was good. Evil was defined as the absence of good and was created by Satan without God's cooperation. And the Cathars believed that in the world, evil manifested as the will to dominate others. I think that's an incredible definition of evil. The wish, the will, the attempt to dominate other people. Catharism was uh, uh, non-political because all, all earthly hierarchies were considered evil because they were sustained by power. There were no churches. Meetings were held in the homes of nobles, many of whom were very sympathetic to Catharism, and also in natural settings like the woods. Truth was conveyed not by dogma, but, but, but by individual revelation. Dr. Uh, Girdham defines Catharism as an enlightened and positive creed. In contrast, the Catholic influence view was that it was a dour and ascetic religion. The holiest book for the Cathars was the Gospel of St. John, widely considered the most mystical gospel. The Trinity was not emphasized, but the Holy Spirit was venerated and was considered feminine. Catharism itself had a simple hierarchical structure. There were originally four areas of division or bishoprics, and eventually that was expanded to five just before uh, <coughs> the uh, Cathars were really destroyed. Here are my conclusions, and I only have three. Number one, the experiences and writings of Dr. Gertham offer an amazing and convincing proof of reincarnation to me, and also of this very unusual phenomenon called group reincarnation. And the one other book that I wanted to point out to you was this one. This is absolutely fascinating. The Lake and the Castle. Um, and um, The Lake and the Castle is about um, three other lifetimes that this group had together. Once in uh, uh, Rome, uh, once in 7th century Cumberland, England, uh, uh, and uh, I mentioned this in my bibliography um, as Celts, Celtic priests and priestesses and once in the Napoleonic era, where Dr. Girdham apparently was a spy for the Napoleonic uh, side, but spent, <laughs> spent, spent a considerable amount of time at a castle, uh, Porchester, and I believe the castle in this refers to the castle of Porchester, as well as the castle of Montségur. So, um, the second, 
uh, conclusion, and then I have one more and I will end. The destruction of Catharism by the Catholic Church and the armies of the French king and the northern nobles brought about the loss of a living spiritual practice of great truth and beauty. I was discussing this and giving my presentation to my dear wife who uh, is tolerant and patient with me in giving these presentations. And she said the following, which I thought was such a meaningful quote. She said that we've been cheated of part of the spiritual birthright of our Judeo-Christian heritage. I think that's a very deep and meaningful commentary. Tragically and ironically, it was destroyed in a religious war, which also has been a, a tragic heritage of our West, Western culture still plaguing us today. And my final conclusion is, we will have a thrilling opportunity <laughs> to learn more about the Cathars, the troubadours, the Templars, in our upcoming quest to southern France. Thank you so much for your attention. Yes.